Thanks very much for staying here. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is uh, joint work with, uh, with Ulisse uh, Stefanelli here from Vienna uh, and with my PhD student, uh, Luca Kurt, who of course uh, deserves all, all the credit um, for, for all of this uh, work here. Um, I mean, my main contribution was making the, the logo of my u university so nicely transparent on the first slide, which is harder than it looks. <laughs> so, so what am I, um, what am I trying to talk about? So, so the, the, basic, uh, the basic model that I'm trying to look at is, is sort of in the, the very simplest case that I can think of, of, a, of an interface that I'm going to say is the graph of some function u, so some gamma uh, is the graph of some evolving function u uh, that should uh, propagate uh, to a, uh, through a, uh, a medium that, that somehow has obstacles in it, so that I noted here by these little dark blue uh, uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of balls. Um, and so this is Rn, and then we have the propagation direction. So the whole interface is an n-dimensional uh, surface in Rn plus one that sort of propagates through here. Um, and it should propagate in some kind of heterogeneous medium. And the heterogeneous medium I would describe simply by some function phi that is mostly zero, but only where these obstacles are, it's somehow positive. This is the simplest way. And then, so how would, the, the, the simplest model and the first model that we looked at, this has been, this is basically old news, so this is um, so about almost 10 years ago, I started looking at this kind of, um, uh, these kind of systems, and we wrote down a very simple sort of model for evolution of, of such an interface. So the time derivative of u, and then sort of we assume that this interface has some kind of surface or line tension to it, and then we're linearized and, and we get a Laplacian as a linearization of it. Um, and then sort of locally, this term comes about that if, if sort of this, this, the graph of this function u, i.e. the interface, wants to uh, propagate through one of those obstacles. Somehow, if I take this on the other side, it feels like a, a, a downward pointing force. So there is some kind of uh, inhibition of the propagation localized when the graph of the function tries to cross uh, these obstacles. Uh, and then there is sort of a, a uniform constant driving force that is supposed to push everything upward somehow. And we start Let's just take u0 is 0, we start somehow at the bottom. So the idea is that I basically have some kind of face boundary or maybe a dislocation line if you want that starts at one part of the domain and there's a force that wants to sort of push it through to the whole domain, but locally there's, a, there's an obstacle. So the main question that we're trying to ask is, uh, is one that can be phrased in terms of emergence of, of a hysteresis, so basically uh, I want to not look at the details of solutions of this equation, but I take sort of, I want to look at what's the sort of the macroscopic behavior of these solutions for more or less long times. If I take the, the, the external forcing as somehow as a parameter, and in particular we want to know sort of is there some kind of a critical force that uh, if my forcing is below this critical force, somehow everything gets stuck, and you can phrase this in terms of a emergence of, of hysteresis maybe, that basically, you know, if this is your sort of applied force, there's some critical driving force that basically the interface gets stuck near zero and doesn't propagate, but then when you hit the critical force, somehow the interface starts to propagate until maybe it reaches the end of the, of the domain, and then if you go back in the other direction maybe, uh, uh, you should get some kind of hysteresis loop from this pinning and depinning behavior. Okay, so um, to be slightly more concrete, uh, we fix sort of, there, there are many, many options uh, and, and the, the differences are, are purely technical in what exactly you take for this function phi. The simplest case that is in line with sort of what I, the picture that I showed you before is that I basically, what I want to do is I uh, essentially somehow randomly scatter points in my domain and then I put little disks around those points in my domain and, and the function phi is basically non-zero on those little disks. 
This is all I'm doing here. And, and here, since there is some... So, 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 of course, the interesting case somehow is if these uh, obstacles are not sort of periodically distributed, but if they're somehow random. So this was always sort of a, a collaboration between sort of some analysis and some, some probability where you see immediately what the biggest difficulty is because I cannot name my probability space omega because I need omega for a domain later, so this is all terrible. So it shall remain unnamed here. And there is sort of this relatively old result now that if we distribute these uh, obstacles uh, by a Poisson process in this domain of propagation, which is probably the most reasonable, reasonable assumption for, for randomly scattered precipitates in some domain, um, then indeed um, we get a strictly positive criti critical driving force below which the whole propagating solution get stuck, in particular, since this kind of equation nicely satisfies a comparison principle, once we can construct a stationary super solution to this problem that is above my initial condition, we immediately have that the evolving solution remains stuck, as you see in the last line here, below this stationary solution, and, and we have pinning. That's what I would claim. Now, I can tell you a little bit about how to prove this. Um, basically, the idea on how to do this, um, it, you can't use purely sort of periodic arguments here. You have to do a little bit more. The idea basically is the following. Well, try to split your domain into little, little boxes, kind of like this, right? And then you say that a box is somehow good if there is an obstacle inside this box. And then clearly, since this is a Poisson process, each box has a certain probability independent of one another to have an obstacle in it. So if you look at sort of these stacks of boxes by, for fixed x and y direction, you stack these boxes, you will find an obstacle at some height. Right? That's pretty clear. That's a very simple argument. Basically, a Borel, if you really want a borel cantelli type argument. But then you have a little problem, because let's say there was an obstacle here. So now, if I want to do a periodic-like periodic construction, I need these obstacles in which I can sort of have my super solution have positive curvature, because then it counteracts, the, the obstacle sort of counteracts the positive Laplacian there. And I would somehow try to connect this, so here is no problem. But here I'm getting a problem now, because maybe I found my first obstacle here very high and here very high as well. Then I have a, a, need a very large sort of second derivative here uh, to be able to connect this. But then sort of this maybe is stronger than the obstacle. So the whole thing then depends on some kind of percolation problem that at some point we can find basically a layer of obstacles there. Uh, if I go left and right one box, essentially, I only have to go up and down no more than one box. And that bounds sort of the second derivative here, and the rest are some scaling arguments with the size and the height of these boxes. So for that, we get sort of a critical F star um, that is for, for which we can get a deterministic lower bound that only depends on what exactly my function phi looks like uh, and, and what the, the statistics of my obstacles are. And for example, what, what the, the radius rho here is and all these things. But it's deterministic, it's not... Um, uh. so, so now, however, I was always uh, very unsatisfied with this exact model here. I, I always thought this was very unsatisfying. Uh, because the way I wrote this model, if you look at it, uh, if I maybe put this on the right-hand side, then, then the obstacles actually kind of exert a force on, the, on this boundary, on this interface. And that seems very unphysical to me. So basically what this means is if I start my initial condition, u equals zero here, and it crosses an obstacle for some reason, uh, then 
then the, the, the obstacle sort of pushes my domain downward out of the obstacle, and that just seems very odd. And it also leads to other problems. For example, if we actually want sort of this hysteresis, there is no way we can just reverse the forcing, because in the other direction, I have no obstacles, right? Because they will always push that. So, so there, I always make these weird arguments that then I have to flip the signs of everything and things like that. That seems very unnatural to me, in a way. So, uh, so, so this, is, this is weird. So, and if we actually want solutions that converge point-wise, we always assumed that the initial condition didn't intersect any obstacles and things like that, which is also odd. So it would be maybe much nicer to have a model that doesn't have these problems. But turns out, oh, I can do this. So what would be nice, in my opinion, is the following. What I would like to have is, if I have an obstacle here and a, a, an evolving uh, a solution, then maybe it should, for example, cost a certain amount of energy to cross an obstacle in a rate-independent fashion. And that would immediately mean that you know, there's a force if I cross the obstacle, that if I want to cross it upwards, there's a force that goes down. If I want to cross the, it from this way, there's a force that just counteracts the evolution. Right? So I want to have, exactly as in the title, the obstacles should have some kind of rate-independent friction associated to them that only happens sort of if the graph crosses this obstacle. And I mean, you can write it down easily, you get some kind of differential inclusion. Uh, with a, the normal viscous friction here, everything else is the same. The only thing now is I basically have a sine of ut here to always get sort of the, ops, the, the force opposing the direction of travel. So, so this is then uh, the subdifferential of the app. Also, the simplest way I can put here uh, uh, is just to have the, the subdifferential of the absolute value. So this would be a much nicer model. Now, um, uh, of course, the one thing that we need for this now is some kind of uh, comparison principle. So we need some kind of comparison principle for uh, these kind of differential inclusions for these set-valued evolutions. Um, and uh, if we get that, we can get some viscosity solutions from that using like Peron's method. And then we can recycle this old construction that I just told you about uh, uh, to maybe prove uh, the pinning result. And indeed, uh, this is true. So here is sort of the, the simplest comparison principle. Uh, I wrote it here for smooth functions, so, uh, so, and on a bounded domain. So this is where I needed my omega. Uh, so we have a bounded domain, uh, a finite time interval, uh, and we assume some, some nice uh, uh, regularity assumptions. So this, this right-hand side is uniformly continuous. And this phi, of course, should be non-negative because it's a friction. Uh, and, and somehow Lipschitz continues, and then I write down this kind of thing. And then my claim is that as long as I have a smooth enough, uh, in this case C21, so that we basically have classical solutions to this, uh, subsolutions to this equation, and by that I mean that I satisfy this equation with, a, uh, with an in, as an inequality, a usual as a subsolution, so ut is always lesser or equal than, than whatever is on the right-hand side. Um, and I want to have a function mu of x and t that at every point in time and space is in the subdifferential of my, U, of, my, uh, of my absolute value of ut, such that this is satisfied. This is what I call a, a subsolution to it. And then equivalently a supersolution with the other sign. And then my cl the claim is if I have a subsolution uh, and a supersolution that satisfy a comparison on the parabolic boundary of my domain, uh, then it's satisfied for all time, this comparison. So this is a, this is a simple comparison principle in the sense of Crandall and Lyons. So, um, I, I, so, so the, the first steps of the proof, uh, I think I'm going to go through very quickly there. Are the, 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 the absolutely normal steps to prove a comparison principle uh, like that. There is nothing new happen, happening, but in order to introduce everything, I, I'm going to show it to you very briefly, so my apologies. If you're familiar with this viscosity solution business, this might be a little uh, boring now. 
so the first thing, since we only assume Lipschitz and not monotonicity, we do an exponential scaling to get a factor of uh, lambda u out. That's the typical one. Instead of uh, little u, I look at e to the minus lambda t little u and call that capital U. This is also why I couldn't call my domain capital U. Um, so then, of course, the only important change in some sense is that my mu now, I still have to evaluate it at little ut for this to make sense, and little ut transforms into this. Then I get these equations which look exactly the same, only the nice thing I can recover uh, a sort of uh, monotonicity as long as my phi at least satisfies like a one-sided Lipschitz condition, so that's fine. Um, so here we go, uh, and I multiplied everything through with e to the minus lambda t. Uh, and it's enough to show that comparison for capital U. Then you do this variable doubling that's also kind of standard. Uh, in, so we assume that this comparison principle was violated, so that a u at some point is actually strictly bigger than my v. Then we do a variable doubling and we penalize uh, that we're evaluating the functions at different points in space and time. That's also pretty typical. Uh, and we know that this soup somehow uh, 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 is actually attained. So we have a maximum here. That's also pretty normal because this is bounded from the above and below. Uh, and we also know that uh, for gamma small enough, uh, this soup is actually still strictly positive, bounded from below by some number. So this is, this is all very standard. Uh, then the next thing is that I'm not going to tell you very much. Uh, so first of all, this is of course achieved somewhere on the, on the closure of my entire domain. Uh, we need it to be achieved on the interior somewhere, but this is also standard. Uh, it can't be at the beginning of time, because then we would violate sort of having a comparison uh, on, the, on, the sort of on the bottom of the parabolic boundary. Uh, it can't be on the, on the other boundary either, at least not for alpha n going to infinity infinitely often, uh, because otherwise we would violate sort of our comparison on the, on the side of the parabolic boundary. It's all absolutely standard. Uh, then we have an, a, a maximum on the interior, uh, and, and the maximum on the interior, as we assume that we have smooth functions, uh, has to be a, a, a critical point. And so these things are satisfied. And then I get, in particular, that ut minus vt evaluated at these two points has to be strictly positive. This is the only reason why we did this, really, that if we violate comparison by some amount, at some point I had to overtake. Okay, so this is, this is uh, uh, and this we call a and this we call b. And we also have a comparison in the second derivatives, of course. And then we can put this together. I plug this in and take the difference between the two equations for the sub and the super solution. Also, this is pretty standard. And we get this, that this kind of um, positive number here is this right-hand side. This is actually just the sub and super solution plugged in here. Uh, done nothing. And now what I do is I use my, my uh, Lipschitz ness because here I evaluate phi at y hat uh, alpha and t hat alpha, and here I evaluate it at x hat alpha and t hat alpha, uh, and I want to use, I want to pull these apart from one another, uh, which isn't a problem either, uh, because I want to plug in x hat alpha and t hat alpha in both, so that I get a nu minus mu. These were sort of the things that needed to be in the subdifferential of the super and subsolution, respectively. Uh, and the rest is sort of the error that I make is bounded by my Lipschitz constant. So nothing happened here. But sort of the only thing that you actually need as an observation now is the following. Because mu had to be in the subdifferential of little ut, and nu had to be uh, in the subdifferential. Uh, of little vt, and we have, well, u is bigger or equal v, because this maximum was actually positive, and the time derivative also had a comparison, this we said because we were at a maximum. We know that my mu of x and t has to be actually bigger or equal nu of x and t. Okay. Uh, 
but then we're essentially done, right? So we can plug this in. We get a contradiction if we make the, the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, lambda that we chose as a, as a, as in the exponential scaling, if we make it big enough, we get a contradiction here. Because uh, uh, as long as I take my alpha to infinity, which means that my x hat alpha sort of goes to y hat alpha. Okay, so then we proved the comparison principle for this. And from that, the proof of the rest is not that hard anymore. Uh, now we need sort of proper, sub proper comparison principle, not just for smooth functions, uh, but this works in the same way as usual that I don't want to get into details in. Uh, you can use usual jensen ishii lemma and replace all derivatives with sub and superjets. Uh, uh, and we get a comparison principle uh, in the usual way. And we can also put this, extend this result on the whole space by assuming some sort of sublinear growth conditions and things like that. This is also pretty standard. So then uh, we immediately, for our equation above here, we can prove existence of viscosity solutions uh, by using a Perron type construction in, the, in the, exactly the usual way. And then uh, the pinning result also immediately follows because the way we phrase this makes it particularly easy in this case uh, because we can actually use exactly the same super solution we used before because as we know we, we construct a stationary however uh, stationary in time however uh, random function and for that we know that we can use for my factor mu or for this thing in the subdifferential, uh, if we want to prove existence of a super solution, we can use sort of the convenient downward pointing force. If we want to prove existence of a subsolution, we can use the convenient upward pointing force. So, so it, it works in exactly the same way. And to show it to you in a picture, what we get is the following. Assume we have some kind of bounded initial condition, then we can always find a super solution that somehow lies above a subsolution that somehow lies below, as long as the forcing is uh, bounded by this critical force, that is the same critical force as we had before, uh, any solution lies in this band between the sub and super solution. Now these are not bounded, they might sort of grow kind of sublinearly, um, but that doesn't matter. Okay. So, so while I think this is fairly nice, I don't know, um, it's a, I think it's a much nicer from a physical point of view model, especially maybe for things like, like dislocations. Um, uh, you can do a little bit more with this. Um, we can generalize this comparison principle uh, in, a, in a usual sort of way uh, uh, because we didn't use anywhere the specific form of the equation. Uh, so we can use sort of the typical form that is, that is used for viscosity solutions in general. Uh, we can solve equations of this form or differential inclusions of this form where on the right-hand side I have some kind of, uh, well, the negative of a maximally monotone operator applied to my UT. It doesn't even need to be maximally monotone. Uh, we only need some simpler continuity-like condition, and I'll give you an example of what works, uh, because con explaining the condition is, is not so interesting. And then sort of this multiplied by something uh, that has to be reasonably smooth and shouldn't depend on the second derivatives, but can still depend on everything else. Uh, and what's also nice, we can even remove the viscous dissipation completely uh, this doesn't have to depend on UT at all, so we can treat purely rate-independent processes, for example, uh, with this method, um, as long as some monotonicity or some continuity conditions are satisfied. And I wanted to just uh, so, so, so give you some examples in a second. Uh, of course, I mean, this, this is, in my opinion, fairly promising for a variety of problems like this. Because if you want to prove existence of rate-independent 
of, of solutions for rate-independent processes, you usually do some kind of minimizing movements to show uh, existence of energetic solutions, for example. But for that, you always need some compactness. You always need sort of that, the, that sort of the energy somehow uh, forces a compact embedding into whatever uh, uh, distance you use for your dissipation. There is absolutely no need for this because this is based on an entirely different argument that has not much to do with compactness. Um, can use unbounded domains. Uh, even if comparison principle doesn't hold, and the other things are, are nice, we can use this uh, concept of discontinuous viscosity solutions, by, explored by Baus, for example, uh, and, and obtain solutions that can jump, and we can rather carefully look at in which way they jump. Of course, uh, this doesn't solve any of the problems from uh, mechanics where people are trying to prove existence using, for example, energetic solutions, because, of course, this doesn't apply to systems, so no elasticity or anything like that. So then that's otherwise... So here are some examples. So this is maybe the simplest example that's, that's, that's in my opinion, kind of interesting. Uh, we can look at the following. ODE, ordinary differential inclusion, if you will, uh, where this E of U is any kind of uh, reasonably Lipschitz nonlinear function. And then what we can do is the following. OK, so, so if, if this E is sort of the derivative of some double well potential or so, so it maybe looks like this. Um, then you know that classically uh, uh, you can make a number of different solutions for this. One would be sort of the energetic solution constructed by minimizing movements, where in each step you look for the, for the global energy minimum. And that would maybe sort of, if you increase, sort of, you, you increase the force and then you see what, what happens, then basically the solution would go up here, then it jumps over here, and then it continues up there. This is sort of the, the globally energy minimizing solution somehow for this. Now you can, of course, also, which has been explored, I think, by Alex Milke as well, you can maybe add a tiny bit of viscosity to this and look at what solutions you get when you let the viscosity go to zero. Uh, then you get sort of this kind of solution, right? Sort of, this is sort of a vanishing viscosity uh, limit of this. And we can recover both of those in this framework of discontinuous viscosity solutions. One will be the supremum of all subsolutions, which is a discontinuous viscosity solution. And the other one will be the infimum of all supersolutions, which also is a discontinuous viscosity solution, in the sense of Gibal. Uh, and uh, at least for this ODE setting, we can prove that no matter what we do here, one is sort of the limit of minimizing movements, and the other one is the vanishing viscosity limit. And any, any kind of reasonable solution should lie in between. Now, what we would like to prove, of course, is this kind of thing for more general equations that, that we get sort of these two solutions and everything lies between. Uh, we can use degenerate equations. I claim that this would be kind of odd to do uh, using uh, energetic solutions because we're not penalizing uh, the full Laplacian here and it's nonlinear. Uh, but this is, of course, a silly equation, so forget about it. Uh, we can also do some odd things because I claim that uh, this operator that we apply to UT, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the negative of a maximally monotone operator works. Uh, but we can also do something that's different. We can do equations where we combine sort of a contact that dry and a viscous friction. In this case, the F would look like this. Sort of, uh, we can do from, let's say, minus two to two here, and then have, so, so a set valued here at, at ut equals zero, and then have it uh, uh, like so otherwise. So, so uh, um, F, of zero is minus two to two, and f of s otherwise is uh, sine 
of s plus s. Something like this uh, works. Uh, uh, works here, and I, 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 I think this would be a little tricky with other sort of solution concepts. And I, I claim, so, so f some physics literature claims that this is relevant in, in, in physics sometimes. No, I, I don't know. And of course you can do other things. A typical thing would be to look at uh, a rate independent mean curvature flow in level sets, which I could write like this, and this is not a problem at all here. And you get a, a rather nice uh, flow that the zero level set of this function u, if its curvature is sort of between plus one and, so in the, in the 2D case, right? If the curvature of it is, is between plus one and minus one, it's stuck. If it's bigger, it sort of evolves in the right direction. So I, I, this may be useful for dislocations, for example, if you believe that sort of the lattice friction is the, is the important thing. And uh, I claim that I'm on time. Uh, with that, I say thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Um, what do you have in mind? Uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, um, as long as you can somehow bound it by some Poisson process, you're fine. Uh, you can, I, I try to write it in the most simple case because it, it, I don't know what, you can, you can clearly, it's not a problem to add uh, dependence as long as you don't add too much dependence, right? Deca quickly enough, decaying dependence, I haven't proved it, but that should clearly be fine. What's easy to see is that finite range dependence is not a problem at all. You can prove exactly the same things. Um, that just goes back of whether you can prove this uh, percolation result that I, I briefly alluded to. Um, there are some things where weird stuff happens if you get very dependent uh, things. If I take obstacles on rows and then delete them with some kind of uh, uh, renewal process that is odd in some ways, then I can generate weird situations. Um, but, but most sort of physically reasonable things should be not a big problem in my opinion. No, no, this is any dimension. So you can construct so, a circle? Yes, yes. So, so the, if to write it correctly, is we do, so we do the following. So we have on, let's say, Zn times n side percolation. Uh, so with, with probability p. Right? And if I say that if my, my probability for e each site is, is declared good or bad independently of one another, right? Uh, each one with probability p. And as long as p is some bigger than some kind of uh, p critical, which is non-trivial, so it's not one, uh, we get uh, that um, there exists a function w from zn uh, to n. Uh, random, so it depends on omega, uh, with uh, w of x minus w of y is bounded by x minus y in the one discrete distance, and uh, x and w of x is good uh, for all x in Zd. And I can say that almost surely such a function exists, as long as enough sites are good. So this is, uh, you can also phrase this, you look at the next nearest neighbor site percolation cluster, and then you can embed the graph of a Lipschitz function in this cluster. And this is older, this was published 
in uh, ECP electronic communications and probability in 2011.